Hello, everybody. I'm Madame Sensei. I teach Spanish, French, and Japanese out here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. And I am talking about adapting the guided language acquisition development techniques, the GLAD techniques, for use in a secondary classroom instead of an elementary total immersion classroom. I teach ninth through 12th grade Spanish, French, and Japanese. And today I have one of my most successful experiments. This is my re envisioning of what an expert group is part four, and today I'm going to talk about song verses. So I was going through GLAD training, and I love that we people who've gone through GLAD training are called gladiators. I think that's hysterical. Um, I wondered if, if each of the material that the expert group learns is kind of bonus. I'm just talking about the expert group. I'm not talking about the big book. The big book is all the crucial stuff, but it seems like when you pull the students out to the expert group, it's almost all bonus material. It's that topping on a baked potato, which I'll talk about in a moment. GLAD is normally used with science or history topics. And for example, when I was going through training, we were learning a second grade um, science topic. Okay, so you learn from the GOIC, the graphic organizer input chart and the pictorial input chart that are posted around the room. You learn that energy comes from the sun and that there's both kinetic energy and static energy and potential energies when you're at the top of a roller coaster and then you go down and the potential energy is released. Okay, so that's the, the basic stuff you learn. But then you're pulled off into your expert group and my expert group was learning about hydroelectric power. Okay, and they learned that um, hydroelectric energy comes from dams, impeding the flow of water. And then we went back to our table groups and we taught our table groups that hydroelectric dams um, store potential energy and all that. And that was all really nice and good. But the main thing still to know was that energy comes from the sun and that moving water also produces energy. But if my table mates forgot the word hydroelectric, I don't really think it was a big deal in the grand scheme of things. So then I started thinking, how do I translate this? Ha ha ha, we linguists love puns. How do I translate this to my classes? at the secondary level, okay? So every second is so precious. My um, my neighbor next door, my colleague, my wonderful colleague, he always says, I only have 180 instructional hours a year. So how are we gonna fit the most into it and make sure that our students retain things? We don't want things in their short-term memory. We want them in their long-term memory. So every second is so precious. Hopefully when the students walk out the class, they're gonna do their Duolingo homework, Maybe they'll watch a YouTube video or a bit of a movie or listen to a song, but they're not likely to do a lot of French or a lot of Spanish or a lot of Japanese outside the classroom. So what, how can I justify pulling them into an expert group if what they're going to learn isn't really crucial in the grand scheme of things? And how do I make it so that when they go back to their table mates, they can parlay that information? And then how much... How much has been lost on the distractions between going to the expert group and going back to the table group? So I thought very, very deeply about that. Now, over the summer, I had this absolutely wonderful conference that um, Shelley Moore spoke at. And I kind of alluded to this in previous videos because, of course, I forgot what I had told you guys already. Shelley Moore is absolutely amazing. It was truly inspiring. And after her speech, it totally re reframed all my thinking about differentiation, okay? So she's got a website, fivemoreminutes.com, and I'll put a link in the description. But um, she has a beautiful story about, oh, you know, I went to school to become a master chef of baked potatoes, and I make the best baked potatoes in the world. And then I go to school to teach my students how to make baked potatoes, and I've made these beautiful baked potatoes for them, and they're all fluffed up, and they're, they're gourmet, and I hand them out to my students. And one student says, uh, I'm lactose intolerant. I can't have the sour cream that you mixed into this. And another student says, I'm vegan, and you put bacon bits on it, and I can't have that. Another student says, ew, I hate scallion. So she says, what you should do is unpack your standards and figure out what is your baked potato, what is absolutely crucial for the students to know. And all the other stuff is your toppings. The other stuff is nice if they know it, but is it really crucial? But um, I, I was very, uh, she put this in such a, a succinct way and um, it, it, it really honestly transformed my thinking after just this one session with her. And I've taken other classes with her because I was so impressed. So thinking about my baked potato, 
which is great because I'm going to talk about a food unit right now. <laughs> All right, so I decided in the restaurant column, okay, I want my students to be able to go to a restaurant. Our big project at the end of the unit is to have a fake restaurant where they come in and they order food from the restaurant. They have to be able to stay in French the whole time. So the crucial things are to greet the waiter. You have to say hi to the waiter, okay? You have to be able to ask for a menu. You have to be able to ask for a recommendation because if you can't read the menu, at least you can ask for a recommendation. That's your cheater, get out of jail free card, right? And then ask for the check. All right, that's the crucial stuff. If you don't know any other French, then you can fake your way through a restaurant with just these things, right? The icing on the cake is knowing the name of this dish or that dish or um, being able to count exact change or whatever. If the, the, the bare minimum, if you can do this, you can be successful in a restaurant. See my icing on a cake. So I got a baked potato and a cake analogy right now, right? So I was writing my big book and I was really tired, right? Because you're using, and my big book was based around my TPRS, my teaching proficiency through reading and, and storytelling. And I don't know, I was really tired as I was like, oh, okay, what sentences do I need to put in this? I need this, I need this. And somehow because I was tired, my brain just kind of stuck on the rhythm of one of the sentences. And those of us who studied a lot of language, we know that music and language is in the same area of the brain. And um, music is also very repetitious, which is good because we need that. Um, so anything we can call back, any, any way we can make these connections for the students. But because my brain stuck on the rhythm of this, I was like, aha, I've got a great repetitious game and this is our expert group, okay? So generally when we read stories, whole class, I'll have the students do something with the story afterwards. Maybe we'll draw a picture. Maybe we'll do a before, during, after comic strip. Um, one of the things my students absolutely love the most is sometimes we read a story and the story really lends itself to, oh, you know what? We're going to write a song about this story. So you've got all the words from the story here. This was a Tom Alsop story from uh, 21 Mini Cuentos. And oh, wow, my students really loved it this year. They they actually like professionally produced a song. <laughs> they, they had so much fun doing this, but they love to write a, a donkey little song about the story. And I was like, well, yeah, we need to do that here too. I have a ton of instrumental songs in my back pocket on my computer because sometimes they don't want to do Mary Had a Little Lamb or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Actually, one of my favorite times was my students were writing a, a song to the tune of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. This one group had chosen Twinkle Twinkle. And one of the students apologized after she's like, sweet désolé, madame, I'm so sorry. I, it started out as Twinkle Twinkle, but it turned into ABC and I don't know how. And I was laughing because I had to point out to her, it's the same song, right? But I have a bunch of just instrumental songs in case they're just, they don't want to use a baby song. So these are these are great instrumental songs. I'm sure you can find a lot of other ones that, hey, I'm going to put on an instrumental song and just write something to that. Um, but as it turned out, as I was preparing this lesson, my local library offered a free class on songwriting. And I love it when my taxpayer dollars support my other taxpayer dollars. You know, if I can get a training at the local library to help me support public education, I think that's like the perfect environment, right? So I signed up for this class and it was absolutely wonderful. And I loved it so much. And I even took it twice because it was so great. So I took my big book as a starting point. And um, we were using Band Lab in the class. And um, I'm going to put my song, my songs are already on band love for free. So if you're worried about, oh, I can't use uh, an existing song because of copyright infringement, which isn't true because you're an educator and education gets a free pass for doing this sort of stuff because education is important. But if you want to use a song that's not copyrighted, use mine, make your own, whatever, it's fine. So I went to, I started with my big book as the basis and I decided that one of the crucial phrases was, what do you recommend? And normally with the big book, you know, we're reading it and I have the students choose something. Okay. And then my last couple are joke ones because you got to keep the students interested. So my last couple are from other stories we've read. Okay. The pudding are larsenic. That's a poisoned cake from Asterix. And La Bouche de Noël, that's a Christmas cake that they're fighting over in um, Panico Village. But um, I want the students to repeat 
je vous conseille a million times, or uh, qu'est-ce que vous me conseillez? What do you recommend to me? I want them to repeat that a million times. So that's really, that's the baked potato. That's the only thing I care about, whether or not they remember le steak frite or um, that pizza is feminine. That's icing on the cake or toppings on the baked potato, if you will, okay? So the sen first sentence that was going around in my head was, Qu'est-ce que vous me conseillez? Okay, so to make the rhyme, J'ai faim, j'ai faim, oh, s'il vous plaît. Qu'est-ce que vous me conseillez? Look, this is French. Play and conseiller rhyme. Bienvenue à la classe de français. Welcome to French, right? So I just want them to repeat this line a million times. And I got that with the song. Okay, and then the waiter gets to decide something. So this is the expert group now. The each table group was going to choose what food they wanted to recommend. But the main thing was this. So everybody had to do this, but the expert groups were choosing their food. Okay. So we went over all the possibilities and I showed you the little pile that these are normally in and um, students can shout out other food that they want and I'll add them. Okay. So again, the baked potato is, what do you recommend to me? Okay, and then the students in their expert group, they get together and they have to write. So now they're writing down, so they're creating their expert group instead of me telling them this is what you're studying. So suddenly it's more relevant. And then they teach their lyrics to the rest of the class. And so now everyone has to sing, what do you recommend to me? And then each group will teach their lyrics to the rest of the class. And what a better, what, what a fabulous concept for expert groups. I love that so much. So the differentiation is totally built right in. One expert group might say, they might have a, a little rhyme about um, it's meat. Another one might say it's brown meat. Another one might say it's hot meat. And another one might say, um, it comes from birds that are raised in Southern France and I've only had it one time when I went to the Space Needle with my family and that's okay. Whatever level they're at, that's your differentiation built in. And the crucial part is what do you recommend to me? I apologize for the change in volume. The bell went off. I wasn't looking at the clock. So I taught my classes and uh, now I'm back. Um, so anyway, we've, we've practiced and practiced and practiced the crucial lines. I lather, rinse, and repeat for all the crucial things that students are going to need to say in a restaurant. Uh, for example, like, what do you recommend for drinks? The waiter's saying, would you like anything else? And then asking for the bill. So in the videos that I'm going to show you, uh, normally, I have five or six expert groups. So it, you'll, the waiter will ask, uh, what do you want to eat? And then one expert group will say, oh, I want to eat pizza. It's round. It's hot. It has cheese. And then we all chant again, what do you want to order? And then the next expert group will say, I, I want to order escargot. Uh, it's like a spiral. It's slimy. It's brown. Um, and so each group will come up with they're baked potato toppings. But for the videos, um, I said I want to record this just to show everyone what my thinking process was. I had each class choose their favorite um, verses for each of the questions. And so you'll only hear one expert group's verse, but everyone chanting it quieter than I had wanted. But um, for you mus musicians out there, I deeply apologize. The way I had piped the music, for my classes, um, it went through the uh, the the smart board and then back to the computer. So there will be a lag that will drive you musicians absolutely bonkers. You'll be like, why are they not on the beat? Well, I apologize for that. Okay. Just trying to appreciate it for what it is and then and think about how you will help me tweak this. Yay! Okay. Awesome. <laughs>
In our next episode, I'm going to talk about um, another expert group on the sentence level um, that we were working on that started off one way, but the students got really good at it really quick, so it quickly morphed into uh, another thing that I had in my back pocket. So that'll be next episode. And don't forget, if you want a written write-up of anything I've said here, you can check out studio-nemo.com for a copy, free copy of the GLAD book or go to the Duolingo Educators Network on Facebook and I've put a free copy there too. Hope to see you on the next one.